uh, emergency plan. Bill Frazier, I'm glad you're here in the room as well. Thank you so much. And Cummings is a me member of our legislative um, delegation. Delegation. Thank you so much. It's getting lifelines all over the place here. Um, Lauren Hyrell is a member of the commission and is going to be managing folks on Zoom. And then Jen Holler is also a member of the commission and she's taking notes. Um, I am going to do a couple things. When, when we're taking a uh, conversation, I'm going to just keep a stack of sort of who's, who wants to make a comment or has something to talk about. And we're going to go through that. There are not a ton of people, so we'll start with two minutes apiece. Uh, and I'm going to go, you know, if Bill has something to say, I'm going to let other people speak before we come back to Bill a second time, just to make sure we're sharing a room. Um, and I've already warned Chief Libby and Tori that I'm probably going to bounce a lot of questions to them because they have a more intimate uh, relationship with the plan than I do. And uh, the, the themes, of course I lost track of my pad over here. Um, the things we're hoping for from you all are first, do you have any clarifying questions about what's in the plan, what you think should be in the plan but don't see in the plan? Uh, do you have any feedback or comments? That would be the second layer uh, of any sort whatsoever. And then um, thinking about what, ne what are the next steps within this plan, right? Um, Mark made the uh, analogy that this is sort of like a coloring book and it's got their, their, their spaces to fill in. And so this is, we are the community. We are responsible for filling in those spaces. Uh, what suggestions do you have? What thoughts do you have? And we are, I'm, Facilitating, but we are the commission listening very carefully tonight because this is sort of our, you know, this is the debut of this plan, which we've underlined quite clearly. It's not a finished document, it's not a finished plan, uh, but it is a very good start. And so then your voices add um, detail to that, and that's what we're looking for. Okay? So, uh, okay, all right. Uh, we may have more folks joining us on Zoom. Who has questions or thoughts about what's in or what's out of the plan? Preliminary and a priori issue that I want to raise, and that's this: on whose authority is this plan being con con constructed? Because this is a this is a government function that we're trying to do here. To another degree, it's a community neighborhood function. On the other end of the extreme. But being that the commission has taken the stance that it is not subject to open meeting or public records law, I'm reluctant to donate my expertise into that filter uh, because there is no, and this commission may well have dissolved by the time the shit hits the pan and people are like, oh, no, well, how did we miss that? You know? And I, I feel like we need to address that head on before we go too much further because the level of specificity and engagement can't be this quasi self-appointed, non-accountable, non-transparent entity. Uh, I think I understand your question. And the way I read the plan is that we've, you know, the commission has uh, hired the consultants, worked with the consultants, did community engagement to build the plan, collaborated with the city to get it to the stage where it's at. And then at this point, or very soon, when the city council considers whether to adopt this and the city staff consider where to fill in their pieces of it, it becomes a municipal plan. And so then then, then it is, you know, it's city staff, it's uh, the accountable city council. Is that a fair assessment of what's happening? You know, we well, don't- we've missed the opportunity to review this global work of what Erica ACDC is doing. We, we missed so that was what the that's what the commission did and this is I mean this tonight and further input right so there there are two ways to give input uh, go beyond this uh, this is the opportunity for public to give thoughts give comments give feedback uh, so that's what we're hoping for tonight Kim. yeah just for background um, I'm not sure if you remember I was the mayor during the 92 flood the mm. last big one and the city did have an emergency management plan then. We had a director. We were told by FEMA we were textbook. So what does the city have now that we are perhaps building on? What still that plan? short form plan that identifies the 
positions that move annually, but it's not certainly not 65 pages of detail um, or with any annexes that that address um, water rescue flooding. It's mostly a list of names and phone numbers. And in, in the uh, I think I mean during the 2023. The city has an emergency plan, which they put into action, right? Move fire trucks out of harm's way, move city staff and operations. Uh, so I think that that's, I think what what's exciting to me about this plan uh, is that this is broadening that and trying to integrate, okay, how, you know, how do we get the community involved in a, in a way that's prepared instead of reactionary? Is that a fair? Yeah, um, I can expand a little bit on that. So the local emergency management Plan, which is that packet there. Um, I was on the working group to create that template. Um, I think it was like 2017, but basically, you know, we had to take into account that there are towns the size of Montpelier with about 8,000 and there's towns with 400 people. So we had to make a statewide template that, you know, at the bare minimum, a small town with no paid town staff could fill out and maintain. And then you know, it's up to larger communities if they have the resources and the staff to do an expanded plan like the Maple is. Have we done in the city an assessment of how it went, what went wrong? Okay, that would be helpful. Well, we did all that and we shared it every, all that with okay. we spoke. We worked pretty close to the development of this plan. Yeah. Was, was that shared with the community? What was the... Uh, Oops, hang on a second. Go ahead. Please I'm finish just following up on Bill Wolf. Yeah, Dan, give him a second to, to finish and then we'll talk with you. Just to be clear. Um, <laughs> so we did an after action uh, report. We actually presented it to the city council uh, at a meeting. And we shared it amongst our staff and obviously with this group. And we, and I think we shared it with the commission, obviously, and, uh, and have welcomed the opportunity to expand the scope of that with this group. And also, I think one of the things that we really heard after the flood in 23 was the link between what our other, you know, there was a lot of demand about how come the city didn't tell me what to do at my house and, and, and those kinds of things. So it was like, who does what? Where's our role? Where's an individual's role? How does that connect? How does communication go out? Was, you know, a lot of confusion about that. We were using VT Alert. We're still trying to get people involved with that. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have done. And yes, it was taken up at a city council meeting review. Uh, uh, when somebody here the chief presented it. Can I, are, are you so with it's ACDC? I am. So you, okay. We just, I'm going to keep track of who's up. We've already heard from you. Give it a second. Dan, uh, Rose? Rosie. Rosie. Yeah. And then Dan, do you want to comment or are you? I have several. Okay. Uh, so let's do Rosie and then Dan. So I had um, just a couple of, of comments of things that I thought maybe um, might be added. Um, one is under um, the financial management section. Um, I, I guess I have <laughs> some experience um, at the state level trying to figure out how to get FEMA to pay for some of this stuff um, after the fact. And one of the things that I noticed is that um, there is a lot about tracking what the city is spending, um, but less about tracking what the needs are. And one of the weaknesses we found in response for the 23 flood is that FEMA was looking for documentation of these specific needs. Um, and so there's a lot of like, okay, we're gonna document that the road was damaged, but also documenting um, the the people needs, the food needs, the um, the impact to to people um, that would have been really helpful to have for FEMA. And um, so, just noting that maybe it's the financial management person who's tracking that, but maybe somebody else, and maybe it's you know the volunteer hub gets tasked with that, but somebody should should be tasked with that in terms of trying to get the most money back to the community afterwards. Um, Another thing I noticed um, was kind of on that front, um, I think there, there's a lot of data that the State Emergency Operations Center is looking for in terms of those human needs, um, and that maybe the, 
the one point of contact isn't necessarily the person who, you know, in this case, Bill in the past is not necessarily the person who's keeping track of all those needs and can't keep track of all those needs. So maybe there's a second point of contact to the State Emergency Operations Center to just kind of give that on the ground, you know, those requests about what, what the needs are aside from just public safety requests. Um, and then um, I also noticed that the school is not really mentioned at all um, as a, a public body. Um, and I know in Vermont we have kind of a little bit of a firewall between schools and towns, but when it comes to emergency response, they really need to be working together. Um, and so I'm sort of would like to see them included, and, and I think they're a key partner and can be a key partner in all of this stuff, um, including communications and resources and, you know, um, you know, just along with library and stuff. Um, am I at my limit? Can I follow you for a second? Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, Tori, do you have any thoughts you want to? Uh, yeah, so the reason that, you know, we have one contact to the state is, you know, to keep it simple. So mm -hmm. the way that it's written in the plan right now is, um, I think the volunteer hub is, would be a, probably appropriate entity to, you know, take in that information of tracking needs. You know, and then they would report that up to Bill, and then it would go up. It kind of goes into that incident command structure that Chief Libby spoke mm -hmm. about a little bit ago. It's just kind of having that linear um, path of communications just to reduce confusion, reduce redundant information, and even misinformation. I, I just remember a lot of people were calling Bill for everything and wondering yeah. if there are some things that we can try to take off Bill's plate. Um, but <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot too much with that. Yeah. He's always, you know, you can always designate it to somebody else too, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, depending on needs. Thank you. Where does it get it? I'll, I'll, I'll come back. Yeah, that's yeah. Back. We got We got a bunch of time. Are you really okay? Yeah. All right. I'm finding this, uh, and I did read the things, uh, a uh, overly bureaucratic response to a uh, situation which shows a great lack of imagination. Uh, I, maybe it's just because watching what's been happening the last two weeks in Asheville and other places that if we went to nine, uh, 14 inches of rain rather than 9 inches of rain, uh, then the kind of destruction that would happen on Route 2, et cetera, would be catastrophic in a way that we uh, have a hard time imagining. And uh, I think we have to start broadening our imagination in terms of what could happen like that because all of the science around climate change says those clouds are going to be holding more and more moisture every year. We're not going to be able to stop it because we've chosen not to, and it's going to get worse. So I would like to see a little more imagination in terms of what is going to be uh, needed in order to have a response where Route 2 is washed out. The idea of having the emergency shelter in Barry is laughable. It was laughable the last time that they keep the same thing in there this time. Well, I found both an insult and a, like a lack of uh, ability to learn from history because we need uh, an emergency shelter here in town that people can access. We probably need two because it turns out the whole west end of town got uh, separated from uh, this side of town, just when Bailey Avenue and State Street flooded. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got a situation where we've got to have more imagination on what possibly can happen, how we're going to mobilize around it. And rather than saying, how is the, the administration going to get up and running again? We had a very mild disaster last year. I know we thought it was catastrophic, but in terms of what you can see going on around the country with climate change right now, it's about to be a whole lot worse. And I think we have to uh, spend some time thinking about that and figuring out how we're going to respond. Thank you. I think before I ask you two to respond to those comments, um, I also read the plan. And one of the things that struck me, Dan, was that the plan is designed not just for a flood, right? It's an emergency response of any sort, which could be, look, why don't you interrupt? Uh, uh, I'd like to talk right. to that, uh, 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 come back to that yeah. one. We, got, we only have a few people, so we're going to have plenty of time. But I, but I think I was struck by, okay, this is not just about floods, right? This is a, this is a community-wide, it's, it's, you know, more severe COVID. It's fire, uh, you know, uh, smoke from wildfires. It's um, uh, a chemical spill. So I think that the, um, one of the things I appreciate about the plan as it is now is that it is broad and it is considering our strength is within our community and in integrating the community with the city. That was my, as a reader, response. 
I'm curious if you have thoughts about it. Yeah, Dan, I appreciate your thoughts on the sheltering. In July 23, July 24, I oversaw the swift water operations for the entire state. And getting people to the Barry Auditorium is a challenge, even in downtown Barry. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we're taking people out of cars, houses, parking lots, wherever, and taking them to a lily pad for a high water vehicle to try and get them up the hill. And, you know, within the Barry city confines, that's a challenge. Um, and for us in Swiftwater to take someone out of a house, a road in Montpelier, and then get them <coughs> downstream or back upstream, uh, upstream. <laughs> get them back upstream to get them to that shelter is, you know, it's an even greater challenge. Um, so I think there are opportunities to look at sheltering capacity within the city for overnight sheltering, right? That welcome pets, because my experience from doing flood response for 40 years is that a lot of people won't leave their house if they can't take their pet to a shelter, right? So having that entire package to make someone realize that it's, you know, your house is what it's gonna be, but we can't replace you. Let's get you and your pets out of here and to a safe place. And when it's safe to come back and evaluate your losses, then that's the time to come back. But for now, you know, when we go downstream, it's really a one opportunity to get in the boat. We can't come back and get you later. Right. Um, and unfortunately, people that either are underserved populations or have pets that can't be sheltered, they make a decision to oftentimes to stay because of that. So, yeah, I won't wait on that if I could. We've advocated for additional shelter space in Montpelier in the last couple of years, even pre-23 flood, um, just based on other for, for all the reasons everyone else has cited. Um, the biggest pushback we've gotten, you know, I, I, pre I agree with you about the imagination. It, then it comes down to what's available for resources and who's actually going to do it. And the shelter is run by the American Red Cross, which are volunteers. And so they have their own limits of what they can operate. So their answer, which we haven't 100% accepted, but their answer is, you know, we have to provide food, we have to provide shelter, bathroom, all these things, medical, psychological, all these things in a location. The very auditorium is the, the place that is the biggest, is the best equipped for it. We can set that up for the most people. It's a huge logistical nightmare. And so we have said, you know, can you set up another? But then they've got to duplicate. So we are at we are actively working with them on certifying, probably it would be smaller. I don't think it could meet the needs of a site in Montpelier. I don't know if it includes pets. Uh, probably the senior center on Barry Street. Uh, it would be a smaller overnight probably shelter. Middle school. It's a conversation, that's a conversation with the school. Uh, so, the, so the, the, here's the thing about the, the senior center is the city owns it and we control it. Um, anybody else, you're, you're <coughs> potentially conflicting with their needs and uses are, you're commandeering their space. Um, you know, Barry City owns the municipal complex there, so they have complete control over it. So I agree, the college would be better, schools would be better, um, but for but the one thing we have going for us is we can say, yeah, you can use it because it's, it's ours. So that is an active work. I don't think they've approved it yet. Um, and they still got to have the wherewithal to set up those two shelters. So 100% agree. 100, you know, if we could put shelters in four places in the city, that would be great. But it really comes down to who's running. Well, I'm just, I, I just went back to the, what happened last year with the, uh, some people were dumped at the uh, middle school, but there was no, <laughs> Not even place for them to sit, where the, let alone water, uh, food. It, a closet with some of that stuff in there would at least be a temporary uh, solution. Completely right. So, David, I, I like that. I the, the specificity of that, right? Is that okay? Let's think it all the way through, right? Which I think is what's exciting about this moment. It's not clearly. It's not all completely thought through. So, I like that. Okay, Tori, I just wanted to give you a chance in case you had any responses to the. Okay. No, I think those are right. Okay. Um, here's what we got coming back to Rosie, then Ann Cummings has been trying to speak for a little bit. Hang in there, I see you. Uh, <laughs> Ann and then Steve after dinner. 
Go ahead, Ann. I, I'm, no, I was just, the one big mistake we made in 92 was that there was no evacuation plan for the school. And they just told the kids to go home, and we took kids off the ice 15 minutes. This was an ice jam, and it was 10 feet high. We took kids off that ice 15 minutes before the ice went out, and it went out like you pulled the plug in a bathtub. Lucky we didn't lose kids. I was told by someone from the school that well, they do have an evacuation plan, and they were told to go to National Life, at least the high school. And um, but if you're at the middle of the elementary school, you've got to get through downtown, which is probably flooded. We did used to use Vermont College, and that was set up the gym, which is nicer now, um, and the Red Cross did did staff it, but I I gather like everyone else, they're having trouble getting volunteers. Yeah, there's, we did, we did, we did, just to follow up on that, we did, we did brief that in the 92 flood was a localized Montpelier flood, right. so all the resources were able to come to the city of Montpelier, National Guard, everybody, and they could sell the Red Cross here. The 93, the 23 flood, 24 floods, even 2011, those were statewide, you know, much wider. So we couldn't just say everyone come to Montpelier because people also were there in Plainfield and the water there, and everybody was the team. So the Red Cross had to make a strategic decision what's the best place in central Vermont to serve all of these people. And, and, and it was very odd now. About people at the middle school, that was really. But we just staged people here. We just staged people there, so we could provide transport because our vehicles could get through where you know our personal vehicles couldn't. So we were taking people in DPW trucks and fire trucks and police cruisers and things like that. So we were getting people to Barry, but you're right. They got stuck at the middle school without much and, and better planning for that. Absolutely great. So you know, I appreciate your responses, Bill, and one of the things that I'm hearing is we just to sit in this room, we can identify better sites in certain situations. And so it may be that one of the roles of the commission is to build, help, you know, bring whoever controls big buildings at BCFA, which is no longer BCFA really, uh, or, you know, the schools to the table and talk that through and think about, you know, to Dan's point, not a, can we use the space in such and such scenarios, but also is it equipped or could it be equipped? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I do have a follow-up question on that, which is I'm not sure that the Red Cross has to be the ones to run the shelter, and I almost think that there's a sheltering training um, for other organizations that want to do that. Um, and so I'm curious about if, if that's the hurdle, and great if we can work with them to get them to do something here, but even if we're looking for kind of those staged shelters here and eventually people get moved to the Barry Auditorium, is that a role that can be, you know, given to a partner organization or, you know, the volunteer hub or something to train for and plan some smaller shelters, maybe multiple shelters within the city um, that are accessible to, to each of the areas that might be cut off from other areas um, as an interim? Um, yeah, great question. Um, so in Vermont, the American Red Cross will stand up, I think it's seven or eight regional shelters across the state. Um, their position is they're not going to be coming to local shelters anymore because they don't have the people or the resources in order to do so. Um, they do put on shelter training um, of all, all levels, um, kind of all the aspects that you spoke to a little bit, Bill. Um, so really, like those local shelters are community run. It could be a nonprofit. It could be a city function in that regard. But yeah, the Red Cross will train you, but they're not going to come and manage it for you. Did I answer your question? Yep, you okay. did. Yeah. <laughs> Just one more piece of information. We were also told that FEMA will train disaster counselors. So people that were working with people in shelters. So 
There is FEMA, and it sounds like there's Red Cross training out there that's available. Yeah, I took the Red Cross shelter training. It was online, um, but you know, someone facilitated it for I think it was four hours long. Um, but yeah, FEMA has a ton of training courses that are you know self-paced, um, or they do virtual or in person. Uh, Daniel. Okay, my I guess overall problem with the uh, plan is that it is an emergency response plan rather than an emergency action plan. Okay, I think we had a great failure last year in not having the police out. Uh, you know, it was evident uh, from the, the people I know, like Roger Hill, etc., that this was going to be a major event well before the night started. Why, why weren't we uh, take being rather safe and sorry on terms of warning people along Elm Street, warning people in the uh, other threatened neighborhoods that maybe there was a problem coming, maybe their cars should be out of there, maybe they should be out of there because this was clearly about the, now we may get that wrong occasionally, but I would rather be, like I said, safe and sorry, and I'd like to see more of an action orientation, both in preparation and how, how do we begin to flag what's going to be needed so that we're prepared, because you can see this stuff coming, rather than try, trying to just say, oh yes, well, I guess we've got an emergency on our hand, let's have, oh, oh, see if we go to this area, we're gonna check this box, this box, this box. Uh, and meanwhile, people are, you know, but what you've got is, I, I saw more on the, in that plan about managing receipts than I did about uh, how we're going to deal with the, uh, the people. And I know we're supposed to have another workshop about, you know, uh, the citizen response. But, you know, it says, oh, well, the, the businesses should get the emergency response uh, notification. Uh, that will help. That's completely abdication of responsibility. The, the city should be out there. Uh, our uh, businesses and our uh, citizens are the core of the city. It's not the city administration. So, thank you. I, I, um, I'm hearing a couple things. Uh, one is about semantics, response versus action. You know, I, uh, one of these was programmed early in the presentation this evening was preparedness, response, and short-term recovery is what this, this plan is about. Uh, and then the other piece is that there's, a, there's another breakout group that's about communication. And I think that the, I guess the third thing, my reflection is, um, the other thing I heard was clarity. Whose role, whose responsibility is what? And I think you're asking for the city to be, to take a really proactive role down to the level of businesses and residences, residents. And I think that this plan, in, or the preparation of this plan, is revealing that the city's capacity I think, I'll jump in, but the city's capacity is pointed in certain specific ways. And then this plan is trying to engage uh, and activate the community, business owners, residents, neighbors of residents, to fill those gaps, to, to take a role. You know, and if, I, if I'm set up for VT alerts and I know that you're my neighbor and may not, I, you know, there's, a, there's a level of responsibility that I would take to go knock on your door, or vice versa. Is that, am I, Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, I, I would say that the emergency, the maple itself is very much operational of management side. The annexes, as those are developed in the department uh, responsibilities, um, certainly speak to more what your actions should be, if A, then B. Um, you know, in the last two, month and a half, we've met with uh, the National Weather Service to get better understanding of when this happens, what, is, what should we expect? Um, I've attended two um, flood meetings with uh, Green Mountain Power in the state of Vermont on dams and you know what your inundation maps really mean. So if there's a problem, what are we looking at? And where are those maps and how do we have those available to us? So I think driving the preparation we should be able to drive that if we're getting water levels, a dam emergency, are we also getting inundation from rains or what are, what's the total picture and what is your individual department's response, response, responsibility for response or action from that information? Yeah, I got a question for Dan actually. You know, I've heard you say a couple times at this meeting and in other locations online that 
the city's plan and the city's goal was just to keep the city running and not and not for the residents and the businesses. I mean, I'm curious what you mean by that. Okay, like um, when I, I have looked at the previous plan and this plan too, but um, the idea of the city, and that's what I was saying, uh, if you read this whole plan, it is like, this department will do this, this department is doing this, uh, et cetera. Uh, what I heard in the rationale from last summer's uh, response was, well, we have the city up and running, uh, again, at the senior center now, uh, and that the bureaucratic functions seem to be the uh, sum total of the effort rather than, okay, we actually have to now start doing other things. That, that was my impression, okay? So, well, so, uh, so that, why, that's what that. does the city, why would the city, well, because the, the city started? Hmm? Why, why What's should the, the city? the goal of the city operating? Um, the goal of the city, you know, it, all, all of these operations have been built over time with what I call the assumption of normalcy bias. In other words, that next year is going to look like last year. That hey, we're Dan, Dan, hold on a second. Huh? So I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, uh, and maybe we might pull back from this road for a second. I'm hearing Bill say, Dan, I've heard this from you a few times, and I think the point that Bill is just, just trying to make is the city exists to serve the people and the businesses. And... The city's job is to stay operational, to do its role of that. And is that what I'm hearing? Right. Okay. So I just want, I don't want to get off. No, I understand. Too far but I think it is what I understand because it's easy to say, yeah, they got the city government up and operational at the senior center. The, the, the function that was operational at the senior center was our communications function. The people that were doing the FEMA paperwork for all the buyouts, all the people that needed aid, and ex and, and expediting building permits free so that they could get their work done in immediate turnaround. Uh, and basically all the planning functions that were, that's what they were doing, that was their prime work. And then the other work uh, during the course of the, the actual event, you know, keeping the city operating was to keep our dispatch functioning, our police, our fire, our public works going so that we could be serving the people and getting out and dealing with those things. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to say this, and for the folks who are watching, when we're talking about, it's important for the city to keep functioning. It's to keep providing services to the residents and businesses. You know, we actually heard your comment um, in 23 about you know the police getting out notified. We did send out many, many notices, and in December of 23, when we had the near flood, our police were going around the streets to see. Would you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry. I'm, we heard your comment and others that, you know, couldn't the police have been out notifying people? Right. You're right. We knew that was coming. We sent out actually 23 separate notices starting on Sunday for an event that happened Monday night, warning people that this was coming, and it was all over the news. You're, you're talking about the December event? No, I'm talking about July oh. 23. Okay, I, I didn't but hear any report. I, I, well, I jumped sorry. back and forth, so my apologies. In July of 23, starting on Sunday, for a Monday night. Can we event. avoid getting into the defensive? No, no. So, no I just, I, it's, it's, I'm, 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 I'm just trying to hear because I, I didn't hear that report from others. I knew that's okay. why I was. So we sent out multiple uh, alerts, and we did start. We organized the whole volunteer hub before it started raining on the 23rd, knowing it was coming. So there was a lot of pre-prep. But when Ann Cummings was mayor, and there was an ice jam, there was no pre-prep. It just happened. Or if there's a sudden explosion. So there are different aspects to these plans that you have to prep for. My point, and to your point earlier, about couldn't the police have gone out? That was a fair comment. So in December of 23, when we thought we were getting enough, flood, we did have people out in the neighborhoods checking to see if there was flooding. You know, we also didn't want to bang on doors if there was no reason to. So we didn't actually alert people because we didn't need to. But we were prepared to, and the same in July of 24. Okay. So we've tried to learn the lessons each time and do better, right? which is kind of what's included. So just, I want people to understand when they make comments sometimes, they think, you know, they, they are being heard and there are reasons for things okay. happening. That Thank, you. Thank you. Thank um, you. We have about 10 minutes left before we're gonna get back into the main room. Uh, Steve is up and then Rosie, I think, has more. Anyone else? Dan, do you wanna come make a look? Hang on though. I'll help. Steve has some comment in the world. Yeah, uh, categories of stuff, again, with reservations, because I don't know what black box all this is going into. Uh, you've heard that. We've got to prepare for floods, for hurricanes that come this way, heat, freeze, 
uh, we're under currently under a coronal mass injection that just happened yesterday, or that is coming, might miss the earth, but it could also wipe out all our comms. Uh, the example I'll share again, I shared at your last forum. I was told, I was waiting through the water turning off propane valves. Somebody needed an evac from above the Sitco down at Lower State. I keep calling this police admin line. They had moved up to the water treatment center. They didn't transfer their admin lines. And, and the chief pretended not to know about it weeks later, you know? I'm like, wait a minute, that's a communications plan? That's just a travesty of incompetence. So you're saying you're saying this is again sort of fill in the fill in the you know color in the lines here. You're saying it's got to be comprehensive in terms of I'm Not, a, I'm a regular citizen. I'm trying to take I'm trying to take an action, facilitate something, and it, I couldn't get through. And so right. we and, could, that, and, can, and that can that can be improved. Our cell towers are going to be down. Even BT alerts not going to work. So so we, I we, just I just want to pause there. There's no question we can all to to Dan's comment about a failure of uh, creativity or imagination. We can all imagine, you know, there could be an EMP and knocks out all electronics and, and so we're relying on running handwritten notes around town. We can always imagine severe things. I think the idea of an emergency, emergency management plan and doing this conversation now is be as prepared as possible, acknowledging that we cannot 100% prepare for everything. Okay, so I see no mention of ham radio. Who are our licensed ham operators? Do they have generators? So how about you present it as, hey, I, how about ham radios? That's a possible solution. How about you present it that way as though it's not a, a lack, right? The plan, as we've said, Don't is- Don't tell me how to present it. I'll just- Well, just, I'm asking you because- yeah, I know. Because there, uh, Steve, there are people in the room who've worked hard on that. And we have said very clearly that this is in process. And so we're asking- But, but for, you're running out of my time. We're right. asking, and mine too. We're asking for you to contribute. So just contribute positively. It's easy enough to do. Ham radio is a good idea. Carry but on. But I've what been saying this stuff for years. I've created, critiqued that plan three years ago as, as a but, joke. But we're here now. OK. okay. The, there's no mention of the neighborhood associations, their role. Did you? So that's that was talked about in the presentation. Voice, but it wasn't in the plan. Right. So this is okay. that's an example of a you keep it to be developed. I don't appreciate I'm it. trying to keep it moving. Uh, we need to plan for what capability of Wi-Fi we can keep up. I know VTEL has no electronics in, the, in their long transport, uh, but the Wi-Fi access points would need to have backup power to them. The one at City Hall. We should have one on the tran at the transit center. We should have one down in BGS. We should, everywhere where people are likely to be gathering and trying to put stuff back together, should have Wi-Fi as a backup because the cell service may be down. And and that kind of, uh, uh, the the conversation about shelters is, is almost farcical because we for five years have been attempting to shelter our unhoused and this is about the best we can do. And, and there's a, quite a parallel here where, where how are we gonna do shelters in a real emergency, but let's like, Look at how we've done five years with the unhoused population. So, Steve, do you have a suggestion about that? I've made plenty of them. Okay. And the, this, they've gone nowhere in this town. I have a real problem with the designating the city manager as the uh, emergency management director. Uh, emergency okay. manager. So, can we pause there for a second? Because this uh, is. I'd a, rather not, because I'm going to run out of time. Well, uh, but it, but we're having a discussion, so. Uh, one of the things that the commission is thinking hard about is, is it fair to expect someone in Bill's role to also have that pretty large role? And to Dan's point, are we really prepared? So that's a big role. And so one of the things that we're thinking about is- Well, if can, we got another can, year out one of things, it, one, a, one of the things that we're thinking about is, uh, how could the city support an in a distinct role, a new staff person for that? What do you think about that? We've already outsourced most of his obligations to Kelly and Lumbra and, and Eric. So there's no reason to be disrespectful. Yeah, I'm asking you a specific oh, question. Oh, yeah, there is. I'm <laughs> asking you a specific question. What do you think of that idea? Yes, it should not be the city manager. Okay, good to know. Um, I was in the basement of City Hall on the last July and suggesting that 15 inches wasn't enough to get the stuff off the floor. They only emptied the bottom row of file cabinets. Okay, so, so wait a second. So you're saying, I mean, things higher. we're hearing that we had volunteers. Yeah, we were there and we could have avoided all the public works files getting flooded and we didn't. Okay, so 
let's point forward, right? The point of this plan is to point forward and do a better job. So we're going to need video conferencing capability, not based on Zoom or Teams, but based on a local video server in order to gather, uh, be it over cellular, Wi-Fi, or fiber connected to convene the decision makers in a serious disaster response. Also, you, the plan or the slides referred to three categories, Derek? Yes. And the fourth category is a regional because if East Montpelier and, and Barry City and Barry Town and, and Callis and Middlesex are involved, how are we gonna share resources or respond to emergencies that are bigger than just Montpelier? And that, that's the fourth category in your in, in your slide. Get a county government. The idea of bridges, okay. that we're gonna, bridges is where the vulnerable, Steve. we don't even bother to list the bridges. You Pause. Yeah. Uh, it's okay, I'll come back to you. I just wanna make sure that we got Rosie, and we got Ann, and we are three minutes out. And one more question. Um, so I have a couple of really different comments. Um, one was there was a quick mention um, about, uh, I think, monitoring the, the water levels. Um, and I'm wondering, I happen to live on an unnamed brook that has um, overflowed and caused a lot of destruction. Um, and that one seems to be getting like lots of really like uh, localized flash flooding that's really impacting our neighborhood. Um, and I think there may be some other ones like that further up Elm Street as well. And I'm wondering about the feasibility of installing some additional like water level monitoring on those um, so that the city has more real time data on what's going on with all the tributaries to the North Branch. I know we've got the flood monitoring stations um, like lower down on the North Branch, but there's not actually any visibility a little bit higher up and that could maybe give us some better information about what's going on. A totally different <laughs> comment um, is um, just wondering about whether there's a role for a flood recovery officer um, I know in the state's emergency operations center, there is that role and wondering about having that role planned for early on in the emergency, again, for some of this tracking, because one of the big issues for us has just been getting, getting the money back and, and getting everybody back on their feet afterwards. Um, and then the last totally different comment is just around, um, food, um, and again, sort of from, from my day job, um, just knowing that there are actually a lot of resources out there um, for uh, paying for food in emergency situations um, from the federal government that we haven't really been taking advantage of. And they're a little complicated to take advantage of, but also not that difficult if we know about it ahead of time and, and plan for it. Um, so just making a plug to think about that and reach out to me and my my day job role to work on that um, because there's some good resources there. Rosie, what's your day job? Uh, I'm the state director of child nutrition programs at the Agency of Education. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, next up, Ann. Yeah, um, in your vulnerable population, you might want to add um, non-English language. That getting translators was an issue. And, uh, we had people who did not understand. Um, the other one was, I get Vermont alerts, and you said you sent out alerts, but I didn't get, I don't remember any from the city. And I didn't know that I was supposed to tune in to the Facebook page to find out what was going on. <laughs> a long time ago. Um, <laughs> When I was a child, we used to get a thing from the fire department. In those days, they rang a number on the horn, and that gave you an address, and you knew where the fire was. And my grandmother and I chased them because my <laughs> grandfather started the fire department. Um, oh, so she started the fires. You have an emergency management card that went out to people that said, in an emergency, this is how the city will communicate with you. Mm -hmm. And if all the electricity goes down, if you're supposed to evacuate, we will do three blows on the whistle for Elm Street and five for Lower State. So I think I can even hear that at my house when it goes off. 
uh, that there is an alternative there because we're seeing in South Carolina, one of the uh, South Carolina, Tennessee, that there, there's nothing there. I mean, yeah. it, it's it's wiped out, and yeah, it, you could come here, but that would be an alternative way that wouldn't. I'm assuming the city still has a generator, and we've gotten it possible. Maybe not, but that we could at least have some base communication so you know. And then if people knew where to go, it would be helpful. Yes. Uh, thank you. And then, uh, Dan, back to you and then Steve. Just quickly, where I started, which is I, I would like to see somewhere in this process that a continuing look at super destructive storms because I believe that's what's the future rather rather that this is nice with the assumption that we're going to continue the way they are but if we have major loss of roadways communication other connections uh, we've got one uh, transformer down here which is in the floodplain on River Street things like that really have to be looked at so that we have a, a better pre preparation for what the uh, climate change uh, catastrophe is uh, is about to deliver from us. So you're looking for, partly you're looking for infrastructure adjustment, which is long-term planning ahead. I, I, want, I want us to have more imagination yes. on what, what can be done, because uh, otherwise we could find ourselves, just looking at the pictures out of Asheville and the other towns is like, yeah. oh. Yeah, it could be bad. Oh, that's sobering. <laughs> uh, we got 30 seconds, and then we got to head back to the big room. Uh, in, in go keeping with the, uh, Communications, two-way radios, the little three to five mile range, no license required. Uh, I don't know if we can keep those stored in protective pouches that even if there's a CME event that wipes out a lot of electronics, those should still be able to work if they weren't, for, if they were protected from the pulse. The pulse is not unlike a, a, new, a neutron bomb pulse and it fries electronics, but you can, Faraday cages and even maybe foil pouches can protect radios that, but also teaching everyone how to scan their essential documents and get them stored in the cloud. That's a fundamental essential. That's such a traumatic thing for people to find their insurance policies and their driver's license, their birth certificates. So uh, that's a neighborhood association type thing. Great. Um, that's enough for now, but again, sort out who's, Who's in charge here, and on, on whose behalf are we doing this? You know? uh, yeah, I'm, I think that question has been answered, but okay. Let's wrap this. Uh, Tori and Chief, uh, thank you very much for joining. Let's head back to the auditorium and wrap it up for the evening. It has not been answered to my satisfaction. Well, that, that's those are two different things, perhaps. Well, then, no, I mean, do we have to litigate to get you over meetings and public records? Um, uh, I, I'm not going to turn to Steve. Well, you should be concerned about that, Lauren. If you're, yeah. It's not a public body. Huh? It's not a public body, but that's a cop out when you're doing government business. Oh, no, there you go. Yes, you are. You have no authority. Oh, is this yours, John? <laughs> oh, thank you. Yep.